Mr. Sergeant of Arms, invite the members into the chamber and close the doors. I hereby declare the House of Representatives of the 113th General Assembly of the State of Tennessee now in session. Will the members please stand with the visitors in the gallery. Please stand and remain standing through the Pledge of Allegiance. Representative Bolso will introduce the chaplain of the day. Representative Bolso, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, it is my great privilege to introduce to you this morning as our chaplain of the day, my neighbor and constituent, Marlene Tidwell. Marlene has spent most of her life working in the nonprofit community. She currently serves as the director of the Tennessee Governmental Prayer Alliance, the Tennessee director of the Con Congressional Prayer Caucus, and the event director for the Tennessee Prayer Breakfast. And she recently released her book, Nature Sings. Ms. Tidwell. Thank you. Before I pray, I want to make a very quick announcement about the 50th Tennessee Prayer Breakfast that is scheduled for next Thursday morning, 7 a.m. at the Lipscomb Allen Arena. This year, our guest speaker will be Walker Zimmerman. Our music will be provided by Stephen Curtis Chapman, who needs no introduction in the choir room. On behalf of the Citizens Committee, and our 2024 chair, Jeremy Harrell, we would be delighted and honored if you would join us for this very special and inspirational event. If you have not yet registered, if there's still time, I will get you a seat. You should have gotten another email this morning, or you can go out to our website at TennesseePrayerBreakfast.org. Send me an email. I'll make sure that you're seated there. Our theme this year is from Micah 6 8, and that is what I want to pray over you this morning as you start your day of business here in the chambers. Will you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you this morning for every member of this body that stands before me today. I thank you for their service to our great state of Tennessee. I thank you, Father, for their time, their talents, and their treasures that they have given to make Tennessee a better place. And I ask today that you would protect them, that you would protect this chambers, that you would protect our great state, and that you would give them great wisdom, great hope and joy as they serve in this capacity. And as your word says from Micah 6, 8, would you help them to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you? I ask this in the powerful and the majestic name of Jesus. Amen. Representative Bolso will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Clark, please take the roll. Roll call. Ms. Clark, please take the roll. Ms. Speaker, 95 members present. Let the journal reflect. Representative Grills and Vaughn are excused. Next order, Mr. Clerk. Welcoming and honoring. Welcome and honoring. Right. Representative Shaw, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, sir, Representative Shaw. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've asked for to take up this House Joint Resolution out of order this morning that is honoring the late uh, Representative Don Ridgeway of Paris, who will be late to rest later today. And of course, uh, I am asking for permission to do that this morning. I move that the rules be suspended for the immediate introduction of House Joint Resolution 106. Mr. Clerk, please read the caption. House Joint Resolution 1006 by Representative Shaw, resolution to honor the memory of Representative Don Ridgeway of Paris. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I request that the court read the resolution. 
Mr. Clerk. Whereas we are greatly saddened to learn of the passing of our former colleague, Representative Don Ridgeway of Paris, and whereas a non-term member of the House of Representatives, Don Ridgeway, ably represented the good people of Henry, Benton, Stewart, Houston, and part of Dixon counties during his illustrious tenure in the General Assembly, and whereas he served as chair of the House Transportation Committee and the House Conservation and Environment Committee and sponsored a great deal of important legislation, and whereas Representative Ridgeway passed legislation to combat odometer fraud, to honor to motor vehicles, and to name the Ned Ray McCorder Bridge, and he was a leader in the redistricting process, and whereas he worked with purpose and conviction to secure funding for the construction of State Route 218 bypass around Paris, and the expansion to four lanes of US Highway 79 from McKenzie through Paris and across Kentucky Lake to Dover, and whereas Don Ridgeway served his party as House Majority Caucus Chair and was a delegate to the 1996 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, Illinois, and whereas after leaving the General Assembly, Don Ridgeway served as director of the Northwest Tennessee Economic Development Council for 21 years and was always referred to as Mr. Don by his colleagues and where as a licensed funeral director at his family's funeral home, he gave back to his community as chairman of the Henry County Board of Education and through his membership in the Optimus Rotary, Rotary Masons and Shriners, he received numerous awards and accolades during his lifelong career of service to others and whereas Don Ridgway was a longtime voting member of the Country Music Association and because of his love of music, he helped promote many colleagues in their music careers, and whereas he was proud graduate of Grove High School, class of 1966, voted friendliest by his classmates, Don Ridgway exemplified this accolade, this accolade throughout his entire life, and whereas a 1970 graduate of the University of Tennessee at Martin, he earned a bachelor's degree in education with an emphasis in history and was a member of Phi Sigma Kappa fraternity. He later served as the UTM Alumni Council President and whereas Don Ridgway taught reading and history at Grove Junior High School before getting into insurance business, working at Balk and Reynolds in Paris, and whereas an avid golfer, he was a former member of Pure Year Country Club and 50-year member of the Paris Country Club, and whereas Don Ridgway was also an avid University of Tennessee Volunteers and Tennessee Titans supporter, he held season tickets for both teams for many years, and whereas the son of the late John D. Ridgway and the late Lily Ruth called Ridgway, Mr. Ridgway loved the idiosyncrasy of his leap day birthday on February 29th, and whereas Don Ridgway is survived by his wife of nearly 55 years, Mary Kate Penn Ridgway, a son, John Penn Ridgway, a brother, T. Leon Ridgway, grandsons, Walker Ridgway and Jackson Ridgway, and several other extended family members, and whereas for 18 years, Don Ridgway was a vital member of this body, and his passing leaves a void in this community and the state that will not easily be filled. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the 113th General Assembly of the State of Tennessee, the Senate concurring, that we honor the memory of our former colleague, Don Ridgway, reflecting fondly upon his numerous contributions to good government in Tennessee and his legacy of effective public service in his community. With that objection, the rules are suspended. Representative Shaw, you're recognized. Move adoption of House Joint Resolution 106. Representative Shaw moves adoption of House Joint Representative Shaw moves adoption of House Joint Resolution 1006. Apologize, Mr. Speaker. There we go. Properly seconded. Any objection to the question? Seeing none. All those in favor of House Joint Resolution 106 vote aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. It is adopted. House Joint Resolution 106 having received the Constitution majority. I hereby declare adopted without objection. The motion reeks there is tabled. We have another presentation, but we'll do welcome and honor until it's ready. How about that? Representative Johnson of Montgomery. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have three pages with me today. I have my granddaughter, Maggie Johnson, my granddaughter, Hannah Johnson, and Jane Swindell, who's the daughter of Baylor and Ryan Swindell. And I also have in the gallery to my right, my wife of 43 years, Marcia Johnson. <laughs> my, my son, Kurt, his wife, Grace, and Grace's mother, Pam, who I refer to as my partying law. <laughs> Please give them a warm welcome.
Representative Darby, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I'd like to sure welcome a, a great buddy from West Tennessee, Mr. Colby Jones. Colby Jones is one of the better basketball players that's ever come through West Tennessee. He's worship leader at his church. And if it's got handlebars, he can ride a wheelie as far as you want to go. But uh, Colby, thank you for coming. Representative Russell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to wish my brother a happy birthday today. So members, if you see Lieutenant Corey Russell roaming around the state capitol today, tell him his younger brother said happy birthday. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Russell and I would also like to welcome leadership Loudoun County. They'll be here in the, in the people's house today. So if you see them, give them a big warm welcome. Thank you. Representative Hawk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A couple of announcements, uh, well, a couple of welcoming and honoring. It has been Tourism Professionals Week on the Hill, and we thank all of our tourism professionals who do such an incredible job of bringing those tourism dollars into our communities. We had breakfast earlier this morning from the specific Northeast folks, uh, Northeast Tennessee Tourism Association sponsored the breakfast this morning, so let's say thank you to them. And also, I'd be remiss, my dear sweet mother doesn't wa uh, miss watching us very often. Uh, she has a birthday tomorrow. She'll be 78 years old, great health, and uh, she loves the work that we do down here. So happy birthday to my dear sweet mom. Thank you all. Represent Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, please welcome two of my 11 grandkids, Ariana and Brielle, who are serving as pages in the back back there. Make sure you keep them busy. Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, in honor of Women's History Month, want to acknowledge that for the first time in history, there are four legislative women heading up what we call the Quad Caucus. That is the uh, Hispanic Caucus, the National Asian Pacific American Caucus, and the National Native American State Legislative Caucus, and the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. For the first time in history, are all being led by female legislators. So let's give them a hand for that. Representative Pearson. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I want to, one, thank um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wells for coming last week, but for being online and watching with us today and for their courage. And also, I want to remind my colleagues that uh, today, 59 years ago, was Bloody Sunday in Selma, where hundreds of activists who really were regular folks standing up for the right to vote standing up for the community's voice being heard, were brutally beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, peacefully protesting, peacefully demanding that liberty and justice for all be extended to everybody, including black Americans. And so today, 59 years later, I want to thank and honor all of those foot soldiers, especially the black women who organized and mobilized like Amelia Boynton to make that happen. And so let us remember that fight and that struggle for justice even today. Representative Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted today to welcome two folks from the great district of the 45th in Sumner County from Hendersonville, two freshmen at Hendersonville High School. They will serve as my pages today. It's Samantha and John Muggenberg. I told them that sounds like they're straight out of the book from Harry Potter with Muggenberg as a last name, but I promise you they are not from Harry Potter. Please welcome them. Their mom, Shannon, is up in the balcony. They're going to be on pages today. Put them to work. Welcome, guys. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Representative Hill, you're recognized. Mr. Speaker, I request the Sergeant at Arms to escort our guest into the chamber, please. Mr. Sergeant at Arms, please escort the guest to the well. Representative Hale, you're recognized. Mr. Speaker, I request the clerk to read the resolution. Mr. Clerk, please read the resolution. House Suite Resolution 676 by Representative Hale. Resolution honoring and congratulate the Gordonsville High School softball team upon winning the 2023 DSSAA Division I Class A State Championship. Whereas it is fitting that the members of this General Assembly should salute those student athletes who, through their extraordinary efforts, have distinguished themselves as true champions of whom we can all be proud. And whereas pro pro proving themselves to be the fiercest of competitors and as such deserving of the highest regard, the Gordonsville High School softball team captured the 2023 TSSAA Division I Class A State Championship. And whereas the crowning championship victory is only the second in Gordonsville High School history, the first having been claimed in 2014 and came at the end of a banner season in which the Tigerettes had an overall record of 35 and five and whereas scoring five runs in the fifth inning to grab a 5-0 lead over the defending state champion Eagleville High School, Gordonsville ended the title match up with a 5-2 win after star pitcher Kaylee Plumley struck out a batter with the bases loaded and whereas the members of Gordonsville High School softball team epitomize all that is good in today's student athletes as they have achieved a premier level of success in competition while exhibiting the highest degree of character in all aspects of life. And whereas the perseverance, determination, work ethic, and talent of these young women not only made possible a championship season, but also surely bode well for their future success. And whereas the members of this General Assembly find it appropriate to pause in their deliberations to acknowledge and applaud the members of the 2022-2023 Gordonsville High School softball team for their outstanding performance and for serving as examples of an exceptional quality of youth of Tennessee. Now, therefore, be it resolved with the House of Representatives of the 113th General Assembly of the State of Tennessee, the Senate concurring, that we hereby honor and congratulate the Gordonsville High School softball team on winning the 2023 TSSAA Division I Class A State Championship and extend our best wishes for every continuing success in all their future endeavors. Representative Hell, you're recognized. It's a great honor for me this morning. I hear uh, people talk on this floor about the District of Champions. I'm glad to say that District 40 has some champions, uh, and these girls are very deserving. Uh, won the 2023 Division I Class A State Championship in girls softball. Uh, hopefully, they're going to do it again this year. Uh, we've got some uh, basketball teams that's at the Glass House this week and next week out of our district, so we're excited uh, about what's going on in our sports. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, if it's okay, I would like to ask uh, Coach Bush if he would step up to uh, make a comment. Yes, sir. He is recognized. It's an honor to be here today. Speaker of the House, Mr. Hale, General Assembly, we appreciate you guys honoring us. It's an honor to be able to be here and these girls to be represented uh, for winning the state championship. Uh, we hope to return and do it again. And again, it's just an honor and we appreciate you guys representing us and uh, presenting us with the proclamation today. Representative Hale. Would you, Mr. Speaker, would you join us for a photo, please?
Representative Dixie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a group of students that have come across the state of Tennessee with Jack and Jill of America, and they have their fearless leader with them, Mrs. Cecile C. Connolly. And we also have uh, five students from that organization serving as pages. We have Curtis Drake, Michaela Prue, Jordan Johnson, Zebra Bynum, and Tyson Jones. So please make them feel welcome. I think they're in the balcony over there. Please stand up. Uh, they come from all across Tennessee. Stand up. <clears throat> I think they're on both sides. But thank you all for being here. They're here to watch us in action and see what we do and hopefully how we impact Tennessee's with our actions here today. So everyone be on their best behavior. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Lear Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And today is my baby girl Allison's birthday. So please give a round of applause and wish her a happy birthday. Leader Camper. Oh, all right. Representative Raper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to welcome, if you will please stand, Jessica and Israel Farless, uh, two of my constituents good friends, and let's give them a warm house welcome, please. Representative Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chairman Doggett and I would like to recognize leadership Lawrence County in the gallery. To our right, y'all please stand. Come on. Give them a round of applause, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to recognize my cousin, Brady Cope, is in the gallery. Stand up, buddy. One more round of applause, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Sparks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize our property assessor who just won his election last night, Rob Mitchell. Rob is the one that's been pushing this game of chess for critical thinking skills among juveniles. He's also the one that was able to leverage Marcus Meotis, if y'all know who he is, the, has the show The Profit and owner, CEO of Camping World. He was able to get a $5,000 grant. Marcus believed in it so much. And then also Derek Rose, uh, NBA superstar, who d just recently bought 5,000 chess sets. Y'all give it up for Rob Mitchell. Thank you, Rob. Representative Shaw, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like for us to uh, move to reconsider our actions on House Joint Resolution uh, 1006. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to adopt House Joint Resolution 1006 and add all members voting in the affirmative as co-prime sponsors. Representative Shaw moves to adopt and add all members voting in the affirmative as co-prime sponsors. Discussion, Representative Boehner, you want to be recognized on this? All right, very good. Without objection, exclusion is duly noted. Any objection to the question? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye, aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. I declare House Joint Resolution adopted and by a constitutional majority and members voting in the affirmative listed as co-prime sponsors without objection. The motion to reach Sarah's table. <laughs> Representative Shaw. Uh, if I could do a welcome and I'll move from here. Yes, sir. Representative Thank Shaw. you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you and the members to help me welcome this morning Bolivar Central High School uh, History Club is here with us in Bolivar this morning under the direction of Dr. Joseph Johnson and Miss Sandra Allen. If you would all would help me make them welcome this morning. I believe they're somewhere here in the balcony. And if they are, I'd like for them to stand and you help me make them welcome. I'm not for sure they made it or not. Thank you. Representative Bain. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to congratulate Hume Fogg High School, which has made the 3A state basketball tournament and will be playing Upperman High School for their first game. So, Chairman Williams, looking forward to that. Thank you. Representative McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome and acknowledge and thank uh, Ms. Sarita Vaughn of Jack and Jill, who brought her two daughters, uh, Nia and Jada, here to be uh, clerks today. Just an outstanding family, and I know they're in the uh, gallery somewhere, so let's give them a, a warm welcome. Chairman Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to stand and honor uh, our, our, our public schools here. I, I know that Metro Nashville Public School begins their spring break tomorrow, so I just wanted to wish everyone a happy and safe spring break. It's well-deserved. The teachers have been doing a great job across the city of Nashville teaching and educating our students. So I just want to thank all of our public school students here in Nashville and across the state that are going on spring break this week and wish them well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chairman, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a school in my district, Cock County High School. The Lady Reds have made it to the quarterfinals in Murfreesburg today, playing at 4 o'clock. Hopefully, they're going to whoop all of y'all's teams that y'all are representing. Hope they're not playing a team in your district. Representative Crawford, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, on behalf of the Northeast Tennessee delegation, as uh, Chairman Hawk mentioned this morning, we'd like to welcome our Northeast Tennessee Tourism Group and thank them for the breakfast again this morning. But I have some very special guests with me today. Our leadership class from the city of Kingsport, if you guys would please rise. Let's make them feel welcome. Here, here. And the Northeast Tennessee delegation would like to say a special thank you to uh, Miss Laura Barnett and Vanessa Bennett for your all's leadership and for bringing them down. We have a lot of guests uh, in our leadership group that have never been to Nashville, and this is their first time to the Capitol. So we're very welcome. Glad that you're all here, and we welcome you to be here. Let the journal reflect Representative Martin of Carroll is excused. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want, I'm rising to um, thank our uh, Memphis and Shelby County School Board for completing the task of selecting our new superintendent of schools, Dr. Marie Fagan. And I also want to thank interim school superintendent Latanya Williams for all of the hard work she did in bridging the gap between superintendents. So if y'all give them a round of applause, we truly appreciate it. Thank you. Any further recognition or welcome and honoring? Next order, Mr. Clark. Introduction to resolutions. Lear Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That all resolutions properly filed be introduced pursuant to rule number 17 and place on the consent calendar refer to the appropriate standing committee. Without objection. So ordered. Next order, Mr. Clerk. Senate joint resolutions congratulatory memorializing. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that all Senate joint resolutions congratulatory memorializing and line be placed on the consent calendar pursuant to rule number 17. Without objection. So ordered. Next order, Mr. Clerk. Resolutions lying over. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With all resolutions lying over be referred to the appropriate standing committee. Without objection. So ordered. Next order, Mr. Clerk. Introduction of bills. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Moving House Bills 2,991 and 2,992 be introduced and passed on first consideration. Without objection, so ordered. Next order, Ms. Clark. Senate Bills on first consideration. Senator Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Moving Senate Bills 1,293, 1,587, 1,612, 1,613, 1,663, 1,791, 1,806, 1,838, 1,919, 1,953, 1,978, 2,021, 2,024, 2,047, 2,081, 2,082, 2,100, 2,205, 2,484, and 2,584 transmitted by the Senate be held on the desk in third consideration of their companion House Bills. Without objection, so ordered. Next order, Mr. Clerk. Senate bills on second consideration, House bills on second consideration, petitions, memorials, reports of standing committees, reports of select committees, calendars. Mr. Speaker, the House has a consent calendar. 
Chairman Zachary, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move past to the consent counter on third and final consideration. Keep with rule 50. Gentlemen, moves past to the consent counter. Probably second to Mr. Clerk. Any objections been filed? Mr. Speaker, item eight, House Joint Resolution 998 has been objected to by Chairman Sapicki. All right. Anyone seeking recognition on the consent counter? Seeing none, we're voting. All those in favor, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Ayes 91, no nays. Having received the Constitution, majority, I declare the same counter pass. We have objection to the most reconsidered table. Next order, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, the House has a regular calendar. Oh, Representative Clemens, you're recognized.
Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to rule number 21, I move that members be limited to two minutes of debate when recognized on any amendment filed for today's regular calendar. You've heard the motion. There's a second, properly seconded. There is, this is a non-debatable motion, so we're on the board. We're voting on the motion to limit debate on amendments filed for today's regular calendar to two minutes. All of those in favor, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? <clears throat> Cheryl, I. Ms. Clerk, take the vote. I 71, 23 nays. Previous, the uh, motion prevails. Let the journal reflect. Cochran. Representative Cochran is excused. Call it first bill, Mr. Clark. House Bill 949, but Chairman Boyd and others relative to dental benefits. Mr. Speaker, the Senate bill is on the desk. Chairman Boyd, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to substitute and conform to Senate Bill 677. Chairman Boyd moves substitute and conform to Senate Bill 677, probably second without objection. So order, Chairman Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage of Senate Bill 677 on third and final consideration. Chairman Boyd moves passage of Senate Bill 677 on third and final consideration. Probably second. Mr. Clerk, call it first amendment. House Insurance Committee Amendment Number One, Mr. Speaker, it's similar to Senate Amendment One. Chairman Kumar, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move to withdraw. Without objection, committee amendment number one withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, no further amendments. Chairman Boyd, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member Senate Bill 677 is a culmination of nearly a year of conversations and surveys with dentists from across the state of Tennessee about top issues that affect them, their practices, their relationship with dental insurance, and ultimately dental patients in our state. Uh, House Bill 949, the 2024 Dental Insurance Reform Bill, will ultimately modernize and bring into the 21st century the payer and provider relationship in the dental uh, world. This bill will ensure that dentists are paid correctly when they perform a procedure for their patient, and it cleans up areas of code where dental insurance carriers and dentists alike have conflicting implementation of the law. Mr. Speaker, I renew my motion. Chairman Boyd renews his motion. Any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, any objection to the question? Seeing none. All those in favor of Senate Bill 677, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change your vote? Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Ayes 93, no days. Senate Bill 677, have received constitutional majority. I hereby declare pass without objection. Most weeks there's table. Call the next bill, Mr. Clerk. House Bill 2057 by Chairman Carr relative to reappraisal. Chairman Carr, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage of House Bill 2057 on third and final consideration. Chairman Carr moves passage by second. Mr. Clerk, any amendments been filed? Mr. Speaker, no amendments filed. Chairman Carr, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All this bill does is uh, it actually removes the uh, – we've been reappraising our uh, properties anywhere from on a five- to six-year uh, uh, appraisal. Under the current law now, this will uh, – the, what would this bill would allow to be appraised anywhere from one to four years. And the certified tax rate is the same. Uh, sales ratio is the same. And reappraisals are, are all revenue neutral. And this just allows the county to either get on a one to four year cycle to have reappraisals on their property. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I renew my motion. Chairman Carr renews his motion. Any discussion on the bill? Representative Leatherwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, sponsor of the bill. Looking at the fiscal note, it says there will be an increase in local property tax revenue of $100 million. So it says there will be an increase in taxes of $100 million. And uh, who will pay these taxes? Chairman Carr. Thank you. Well, th that fiscal note, uh, it did not consider the current law which requires revenue to be tax neutral. Now, what you're alluding to is the fact that if you reappraise your property and your, your, your house or your property goes up, you might pay a little more in taxes, but all over the full county, the, the tax rate has to come down, the per meal has to come down, and all over the county, this bill will be tax or revenue neutral 
It will not have any more effect as, for, as on the county as charging a higher tax rate. This is not a tax rate or tax increase. It's revenue neutral. Representative Leatherwood. So do you know how they came up with the fiscal note of a hundred million dollar increase in revenue? And I understand what you're saying. It would be neutral for the county, which should be a neutral fiscal note, but they have a hundred million dollar increase. Chairman Carr. Thank you. And to my good fellow from uh, Shelby County there, uh, and to be just as nice as I can be, it was a disagreement between Comptroller, myself, and physical review, and physical review did not want to uh, change that, so uh, we went ahead and passed it out because, and I want to really add again, it is revenue neutral. Representative Leatherwood. Thank you for that explanation. I appreciate that, and I, any of us that have been here for a while probably had a similar experience with fiscal notes, but I understand what you said. In a county, it would be revenue neutral, but for the individuals, as you alluded to, and as we spoke about prior, for individuals, it would not be neutral if um, a particular district is in an area of appreciating values, uh, they would pay more taxes, while an area in the county that had depreciating values would pay less in taxes. So. Just so you know, I have to take that into consideration uh, on this bill. Thank you. Chairman Carr. Thank you. I would put it this way. You can pay a little, if you're on, on the scenario that you're giving, you can pay a little tax, a little each year if your value property goes up, or you can pay a big hike if you wait till six years to do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All right. Representative Ritchie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and sponsor. I uh, received a phone call from our property tax assessor on this particular bill. He didn't, uh, or his exact words almost, is that this is going to end up being almost a positive impact on everybody other than his department. Um, but we have the manpower in Blount County to be able to abide by the shorter periods. He said his concern wasn't so much in Blount County, but for some more of the rural districts that might not have the staffing or the funding to be able to be under the obligation for this. So I asked him point blank, what did it impact in his realm, what he does back in Blount County, where should we end up being on this? He said, this is gonna be in the best interest of Tennessee. And so I'm gonna support the legislation. But my question is, is for those rural districts that he alluded to, what would you end up sharing with them as far as for the concerns that were shared from our tax assessor for limited manpower and resources to get somebody in there? to abide by these shorter time periods. Chairman Carr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When checking with the uh, Property Owners Association and their, uh, their person that represent them, they reached out to most everybody, and according to what they have told me, they, everybody in their office, the way they're doing this, should have enough staff, and the comptroller will have enough staff, and physical, and everybody will have enough staff to actually do this without any other uh, cost to their, to their county. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the sponsor, thank you for the bill. Uh, I have talked to uh, county mayor, several of my county mayors, especially in Bradley County, uh, and under the previous uh, code, I think last year alone, they lost $1 million, which directly impacted their budget. And they're very much in favor of this. It will basically balance the sheet again and not impact their budget. So it's a good bill. I appreciate it. I'm going to vote for it. Thank you. Chairman Carr. Sir. I renew my motion. Representative Raper, I think, was one to chime in, sir. Representative Raper, you're recognized. Yes, I'd, I'd like to add to this. Uh, first of all, this gives options to uh, not only uh, the county, uh, but they can give options to also the citizens. And instead of having a large increase over, say, uh, five or six years, uh, then it can be all the way down to one, two, or three years. And, uh, and it's uh, much easier for a county to be able to budget 
for this. It also uh, makes it much easier uh, that uh, a one-time um, uh, figure that happens over six years, it, it's very difficult for citizens to adjust to that. And I'm going to give it a final analogy and say this, is if somebody went to uh, a uh, insurance company and said, uh, I'm wanting to get uh, car insurance. And they said, okay, it's going to be this exact price, but we can either divide it over 12 years or we can divide it monthly. Most of us would pick the monthly just because it's not such a, a big expense. This is what this does. It does not change the amount. It, it's, a, it, it's revenue neutral, as uh, Chairman Carr said. Thank you. Representative Lafferty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just want to make sure that I understand. Appraisals of the property are going to happen regardless. That's going to come to a head at some point, regardless of what happens with this bill. This bill is simply saying, instead of waiting five or six years for the reappraisal and then seeing a large jump in our tax bill, that it could be spread out over the years for a smaller increase, but still be the same amount. Chairman Carr. Thank you. You're exactly right. And there was, instead, like you say, wait until the six year cycle or five year cycle. They can do it over one, two, three, or four, and that would make the increase little at a time. Yes, sir. Representative Lafferty. Thank you. Representative Doggett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and sponsor. Is this, uh, is this permissive to the local? county governments to make that determination on which cycle that they choose to go on. Chairman Carr. Uh, yes, sir. It, but it does change the law. They can't use the five or six year cycle now. It is permissive, but they cannot wait no longer than four years. They can go to one year, two year, three year, or four year. It's permissive on that. Representative Doggett. Yes, sir. Thank you. Representative Pearson. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, I am opposed to this tax increase uh, to be impacting people in 82 out of 95 of our counties. I, look, all 90, 82 out of 95 of our counties will experience an increase in taxes with this legislation. And as was just mentioned, it is permissive. And so every single year, an assessor would be able to reassess and increase the taxes of our constituents. It's one year, two year, three years, or four years. So they could choose every single year to do this. For these reasons, uh, though I appreciate you sponsor and understand the legislation, I do not think that we should be passing uh, this legislation. I believe that it will hurt and harm our communities. I, I get it, you know, the, the bill is gonna be paid over time or it's gonna be paid after those assessments are due, but people have to adjust to the new property taxes or the costs that they're going to have. And this not, is not allow for them to do that. And so for that reason, I'm, I'm against this legislation and appreciate you. Chairman Carr. Thank you. Any further discussion? Representative Moon. Thank you, Ms. Speaker, and thanks sponsor for bringing this. This bill will have a positive impact on disabled veterans and senior citizens. The current law, when reappraisal does not take place, there's a ratio computed and it has a negative impact on disabled veterans and senior citizens. So thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Leader Camper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Sponsor, with respect to the one, two, three, or four years, once it's voted upon by the county, it sticks, or can they go back and change it? If they vote this year to do two years, does it have to continue to be every two years after that? Or could they come back the next year and say, well, we want to make it three years or one year? Representative Carr. Thank you. That's a great question. I appreciate that. No, they, they, they have the, the choice. It's permissive. They could do it one year or they could wait two years. And then the next time they could do it at one for one year or they could wait four years. It's, it's permissive ever how they want to do it. Leader Camper. And you're saying each year this could possibly happen. Like, let's just say this year they vote we're going to do it every two years. And two years pass. Then they come back and say, no, we want to go to every one year. You're saying that 
it's not set in stone. They can continue to change it, uh, just really based on a vote from the county uh, from the uh, count, uh, county commission. Chairman Carr, that is correct. They are, it is permissive. They can change it. Larry Camper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, sponsor. Chairman Carr. Speaker, uh, could we roll this to the next available space, next calendar? Without objection, roll to the next available space, next available calendar. Five next bill, Mr. Clerk. House Bill 916, but Chair Lady Rudder, relative to coverage for prescription drugs. <clears throat> Representative Rudder, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move for passage of House Bill 916 on third and final consideration. Representative Rudder, Ms. Passage, Bob Second, Mr. Clerk, call First Amendment. House Insurance Committee Amendment Number One. Chairman Kumar, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this amendment rewrites the bill. Move to adopt. Chairman Kumar moves adoption of committee amendment number one. Probably second. Any discussion on amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor of committee amendment number one say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. You adopt it. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, no further amendments. Representative Rudder, you recognize. The whale mic. Whale mic. Representative Rudder, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 916 seeks to eliminate the requirement of white bagging, and it creates options for patients and their physicians to determine the best option for um, obtaining the medication. I renew my motion. Representative Rutter renews her motion. Any discussion on the bill? Representative Pearson. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, sponsor, for the bill. Um, as I understand it, it's only directly going to be affecting providers, but will prices go up or down for consumers? Representative Rutter. This is a... Uh, you, the contracts are um, negotiated between the providers and the insurers just as they are in any contract negotiations. So I couldn't say whether the... Um, Premiums will go up or down. Representative Pearson. Yep. I appreciate that the number of clinicians and the different opportunities for people to get access to the medicine and the reimbursements to happen for providers is increasing this legislation, but that is something that I am concerned about I, and something that we can talk about uh, offline. Uh, but that is a concern whether or not these uh, providers are going to increase our constituents' bills um, with this legislation. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, any objection to the question? Seeing none, we're voting. All those in favor, House Bill 916 is amended. Vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. As every member voted, any members change your vote? I'll text you. I'll text you again. Mr. Clark. Zachary, aye. Crawford, aye. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Ayes 80, 11 days, one president, I voted. House Bill 916, having received a constitutional majority, everybody declared passed by objection, the most rigged table. Call next bill, Mr. Clerk. The House Bill 2122 by Chairman Terry, relative to a continuing education program for healthcare professionals focused on public and office safety. Chairman Terry, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage of House Bill 2122 on third and final consideration. Chairman Terry moves passage. Bob Secretary, Mr. Clerk, call First Amendment. The House Health Committee, Amendment Number One. Vice Chairman Leatherwood, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to adopt and defer to the sponsor for further explanation. Vice Chairman Leatherwood moves adoption of Committee Amendment Number One. Probably second. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor of Committee Amendment Number One say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. You adopt the next amendment, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, no further amendments. Chairman Terry, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The bill directs the Department of Health, in conjunction with the Board of Medical Examiners and a qualifying continuing medical education organization, to develop and make available uh, for medical continuing medical ed, continuing medical education related to public and office safety for healthcare providers. I renew my motion. Chairman Terry renews his motion. Any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, any objection to the question? Seeing none. All those in favor, House Bill 2122 as amended, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote?
Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Ayes 93, no days. House Bill 2122, I'm receiving the Constitution Majority, everybody by Clerk passed by objection, most of the table. Bob, next bill, Mr. Clerk. House Bill 2142 by Representative Martin of Hamilton relative to students who have been adjudicated delinquent. Representative Martin, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage of House Bill 2142 on third and final consideration. Representative Martin, Ms. Passage, Bob, seconded. Mr. Clerk, any amendments been filed? Mr. Speaker, no amendments filed. Representative Martin, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What this bill does is, uh, and, and I renew my motion, but this, what this bill does is it secures that when a student is enrolled in a um, school, that the bill authorizes school to remind parents of their obligation to disclose the delinquent records and to bolster the penalties for non-compliance. And with that, I renew my motion. Representative Martin renews his motion. Any discussion on the bill? Representative Pearson. Thank you, Speaker. Sponsor, I'm deeply concerned about this legislation. Um, uh, as you read it, the student's parent, guardian, or legal custodian uh, has to send information about whether the student has been adjudicated delinquent for any f offense listed in subsection B, and it lists a whole lot of these offenses um, here. I, I don't clearly understand how or why we think increasing these penalties or this laundry list that you write here is going to help the children who are in need or help the children who have committed these acts or allegedly have committed them. I'm not sure if convictions are necessary. And so why are we increasing the penalty um, uh, on parents uh, instead of doing all that's in our power to actually invest and support uh, as we should, the children who are in these difficult situations. Representative Martin. Thank you for your uh, question. Well, what we're doing here is we're increasing the penalty from 50 to 500 for those that don't disclose. It's already the law that parents are supposed to disclose if their child has been adjudicated to the school. It's very important that our administrators, our teachers, and that our children in our schools are safe. And so... One of the good things about this is that when a principal is aware that a child has been convicted or been adjudicated somewhere, they're able to put together a plan for that new student who's been enrolled so that they can get the very services and help that you're, that you're discussing. What this does is this makes it where it's indiscriminatory uh, there, that in the sense that every student who is newly enrolled in a Tennessee public school, their parent or legal guardian will be asked that question so that the school system knows that and they can make sure that the child gets the services that they need and the school knows if they've had uh, a, a kid, uh, a child enrolled who's committed some serious crimes here. We're not talking about two kids getting in a fight, you know, over a girlfriend or something like that. You're talking about some serious crimes here. And I think it's really important that our teachers and principals, uh, that they, they have the ability, the knowledge of what's going on, and they have the ability to address that. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I would renew my motion. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, sponsor, I appreciate your, your answer here. That's a quick question. It is for individuals who have been adjudicated or convicted. Representative Martin. Yes. Representative Pearson. Thank you. Because, again, and this is some other legislation that deals with, you know, determining guilt or innocence before a trial has happened, before a court or a jury has decided someone's guilt or innocence. And, I, again, it, it is, uh, one, prompting a parent to answer a question about their children who are under the age of 18's uh, history and background, which I have problems with. And when it comes to parental choice, why is a parent being forced to do this in the first place instead of protecting their child's dignity, protecting their child um, in all the ways that we would want for parents to do? And you don't even offer an option for a parent to opt into doing this instead of indeed making schools safer by doing other legislative things that I argue about and fight about a whole 
lot, we're now increasing the penalty for parents for not notifying from a class C misdemeanor to a class B misdemeanor. And what also troubles me is that any, uh, according to your legislation, it says upon request of the school principal or the principal's designee, the school principal or the principal's designee shall ask in writing, which may be provided in a printed or digital form, a student's parent, guardian, or legal custodian, whether the student has been adjudicated delinquent for any offense listed in subsection B. So they can just go to a parent who has not checked that box in writing and just ask, I think your child looks like somebody who has been adjudicated for a crime. And if they refuse to comply with that and say, that's biased, that's racist, I refuse to comply, you are now making it a misdemeanor. Like, unfortunately, I believe that this will have unintended consequences that this will enhance racial profiling, that this does not make schools safer because it takes away the parents' right to protect their children who may have done something terrible or have not even been convicted of anything that they have been accused of. This is not parental choice. This is not making schools safer. This is not protecting our communities. And so I ask that all of my colleagues, please do not move this bill forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Martin. Thank you for your comments. This has nothing to do with race, absolutely nothing. And it's insulting to think that someone would inject that. Every student that's enrolled in our public school will be asked this question. It is already the law that parents are to disclose this information because it's important that our schools are safe and that our administrators know who's in the building. And if someone has committed a rape or a carjack or a murder, I want my kid in that public school, I want their administrator to know who's in that school for the safety of my wife who's a public school teacher, for the safety of the children. And to bring race into this and say that we're only going to pick and choose certain ones is a fallacy. And I would ask you to continue to enhance the laws that we already have on the books. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I renew my motion. Your time's up, sir. We can we give it a shot. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's a long shot, isn't it? Depends on what happens. I don't and, know. And, and Mr. Speaker, I did notice that when they start banging on the desk, you gave them a sideways gavel, not a upright gavel. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Mr. Sponsor, thank you, because I, I, I do I do understand the purpose of this bill, and I think it's important. I think it's important. I do have some questions, though. Uh, in some cases, the juvenile records are sealed. What does a parent do in, in that case? Representative Martin. This has nothing to do with unsealing or revealing any juvenile records that are done in the juvenile court system. That's a separate conversation. Representative Parkinson. Th thank you for that. If you don't mind, then explain to me how, how it will work, if you don't mind. And I really have some legitimate questions, so I pray that you won't run the clock on me. I really do have some questions. Representative Martin. I'm not going to run the clock on you, my friend. Representative Parkinson. Because I think we're dealing honestly here, and I appreciate that. All right. Representative so when, when a person uh, is enrolled in school, they would have to check if they, they would, the, the, the school, all Tennessee schools, would they would offer to the parents a form where they would sign, has your kid been adjudicated of a crime or adjudicated in the juvenile system? And it's a simple yes or no. And then I think it's one of those things that, you know, the law already says that those things have to be very much kept to the people that need to know, need to know. Not everyone needs to know. In fact, there are penalties for those that would disclose that inappropriately. So we're not trying to hurt anybody here. We're trying to help make sure our schools are safe and also to make sure that a child who's had trouble, maybe they were enrolled in a school in Kentucky and they moved here and they've had some issues. We want to help them. We want to help them be successful. So if we know these things, we're able to get the right counseling. We're able to get the right people to help them in the right class situation. It's something that we're trying to help kids with, not trying to hurt them. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you. So, so I'm clear, the, when, when the parent checks the box, they have to disclose what crime it was that the juvenile was adjudicated of also? Representative Martin. If they have committed one of those crimes that is already listed in code, 
that's already listed today. This law is already in effect. What this bill is doing is enhancing it where it's something that no one can say, well, you gave it to this kid because of uh, some reason and you didn't give it to this kid for another reason. We're doing away with that. Everybody's going to be asked going forward and we're taking the fine from a mere $50 to 500. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that. And and, and that's a, that helps clarify for me that the we've already been doing this. You're just basically increasing the penalty. But let me ask you this. When the, when that information, when the parent is asked to check that box, uh, are they being told that you're, you're, you have to disclose this under the uh, uh, possibility of uh, a penalty? And, and the reason why I'm asking that is because what about parents that don't know that this law exists? I didn't know this law existed. Representative Martin. Yeah, if, if a parent doesn't know, they're harmless. I mean, take the situation. The law says that in another section. But let's take, for example, that a man and a woman had a child and that uh, they were divorced and he was living with his mama. And then he ended up coming back to live with his dad. But his dad didn't know any about any of that. That father is not going to be held accountable because he didn't know about the situation with his uh, son that had perhaps been adjudicated. If he didn't know, he didn't know. Representative Parkinson. And, and thank you for that. But uh, but I was thinking more, and, and I appreciate that explanation, but I was thinking more along the lines of a parent that thinks that they can keep their child's information private and not disclose. But I think it would be important for those schools to explain that you have to, by law, you know, give this information. So I hope that's in your bill. My last question is, is does this apply to private schools also? Representative Martin. This bill and the law relates to our public Tennessee schools right now. Representative Parkson. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sponsor. I appreciate it. Representative Martin. I want to observe that I did not run the clock out. Rep <laughs> Representative Towns. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sponsor, you s stated that it does not apply to our additional schools or private schools, is there a reason that that doesn't apply? Representative Martin. We're enhancing the law and the law as it stands relates to our public schools. Representative Towns. Roughly, how many kids do you think we have across the state in private schools? Just roughly. Representative Martin. I, I'm not sure of that and I'm not sure what that has to do with this bill because this deals with our public schools. Representative Towns. Point becomes that all our kids need protection. All our students, all our teachers, all administrators would need the same protection, I would think, because of what happens in the public school. Obviously, it can happen in these other schools, such as Covenant and other other schools that, that are in our community. And I would feel if it's going to be something that's going to be good for our students, our parents, that we would look at it from a holistic perspective. And everyone should be included, because if there's a real dangerous young person. OK, that we need to know about if there is, whether they be in private schools, public schools or, what, or well, God forbid, homeschool, you still got the same problem. And uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Representative Martin. This bill deals with our public schools. I look forward to having your support today for this. And we can work together next year to address the concerns that you're bringing up. Representative Towns. I look forward to it, too. It is a concern. Uh, to make sure that we protect all our kids, all our administrators throughout this uh, great state of Tennessee. And Mr. Speaker, thank you for that. Representative Martin. All right. I renew my. Representative Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move previous question. Previous question been called. Is there objection? Seeing none, we're. All right, we're on board for previous question. All those in favor of previous question, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Elder John. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Aye, 71, 23 nays. Previous question prevails. We are voting. All those in favor of House Bill 2142, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Again, aye.
Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. I have 75, 20 nays. House Bill 2142, I've received a constitutional majority. Everybody declare pass without objection. Most freaks there's table. Call up next bill, Mr. Clerk. House Bill 2146 by Representative Martin, relative to auctions of previously titled motor vehicles that are antique or unique. Mr. Speaker, the Senate bill is on the desk. Representative Martin, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to substitute and conform to Senate Bill 2001. Representative Martin moves to substitute and conform to Senate Bill 2001, probably seconded without objection. So ordered. Representative Martin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage of Senate Bill 2001 on third and final consideration. Representative Martin moves passage of Senate Bill 2001 on third and final consideration. Probably seconded. Ms. Clerk, call First Amendment. House Commerce Committee Amendment Number 1, Mr. Speaker, same as Senate Amendment Number 1. Vice Chairman Bricken, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Same as the Senate amendment, move to withdraw. Without objection, committee amendment number one, withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, no further amendments. Representative Martin, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the bill that uh, allows for an auction in Chattanooga at the Motor Cost Festival for the antique cars and the unique. And it's something that we have brought year after year, and we would ask uh, for your support again. And with that, Mr. Speaker, that explanation, I renew my motion. Representative Martin renews his motion. Any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, any objection to the question? Seeing none. All those in favor of Senate Bill 2001, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member cast a vote? Does any member wish to change their vote? Rudd aye. Lamberth aye. Hicks aye. Rudd aye. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. I was 94, no names. Senate Bill 2001 have received a constitutional majority. Everybody declare pass without objection. Most reeks here's table. Call the next bill, Mr. Clark. House Bill 2119 by Chairman Faison and others relative to eminent domain. Chairman Faison, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage House Bill 2119 on third and final consideration. Chairman Faison moves passage following second. Mr. Clark, call the First Amendment. House Civil Justice Committee Amendment number one. Chairman Farmer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment uh, makes several adjustments to the bill. Move to adopt and defer to the sponsor for further explanation. Chairman Farmer moves adoption. Committee amendment number one, probably seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor, committee amendment number one, say aye, aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. You adopt the next amendment, Ms. Clark. House Amendment 2 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was not timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Speaker. Colleagues, when we're talking about eminent domain, it requires like our close attention. Uh, private property rights are extremely important in our state and ensuring that our property, those of our constituents, is not infringed upon or taken without serious need um, for public consideration, I think is really important. The bill, uh, honestly, the previous sections I, I agree with, I think are fine, but I do not believe that in section C, where it says this does not apply to condemnation actions for projects or uses regarding streets, highways, roads, bridges, transportation, utilities, utility water, public water projects, sewer and electricity should be exempted. I believe that every landowner who is having their land taken uh, through eminent domain needs the protections that are mentioned in section one and no entity, regardless of the public use, should be exempt from that. And so for, with that, I move for consideration. Representative Pearson moves for uh, consideration. You've heard the motion probably seconded. We're voting for consideration of amendment number two. All those in favor of considering amendment number two, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does anyone wish to change their vote? Rudd, no. Mr. Clerk. Please take the vote. Ayes 23, 70 nays. In accordance with Rule 60B, having failed to receive the necessary two thirds vote, the motion to consider amendment number two fails. Next amendment, Mr. Clark. Mr. Speaker, no further amendments. Chairman Faison, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, that's encouraging to me that the gentleman from Shelby County, uh, along very bipartisan lines, realizes that property rights are paramount. It's arguably that our Constitution gives more rights to property owners than any other rights there. That, that, that could be argued. So I'm encouraged to hear that. And we have representative from Sevier County and myself have a area that a condemner was starting to condemn property that a local hospital owned. It piqued my interest as well as other interests. 
So I started digging the TCA to look at what requirements, what, what parameters are established in the TCA to a condemner before they condemn property. The more I got into it, the more I realized that there, the guardrails weren't very strict. So we put together four things that would make a guardrail, if you will, on a condemner before they took a piece of property by eminent domain. The bill that you have in front of you does four things. The first one, before you take a piece of property for public use in eminent domain, the land has to be for public use. It can't be sold to another private entity. It can't be done anything like that. It's got, you have to prove that it is for public use according to the definition of public use in our current TCA. Secondly, the condemner has to have a schedule to complete and a timetable. We have seen historically when I got into this, I was called by people all across this state where somebody condemned land, took land by eminent domain 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they still have not done anything with it. So we're saying in Tennessee now, if we pass this bill, that if you take a piece of land, you have to have a plan. You have to have a timetable. The third thing we seek to do is if you do take this piece of property, you have to have funding available, either the cash in hand to be able to do the project or the ability to harness financing to finance the project. Lastly, we want to make sure that other property close to that property is not available. We actually saw that in my community. There was a piece of property that was readily available and for whatever reason, the condemner was not interested in that and it was right next door. So those four things we believe put in a good framework before somebody's property is taken by eminent domain. And with that, I renew my motion. Chairman Fazer renews his motion. Any discussion on the bill? Chairman Clemens, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, sponsor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see here that they've got to prove those four things by preponderance of the evidence. Is that increasing the burden of proof for the people seeking to exercise eminent domain? Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, that is making a heavier burden on the condemner. Chairman Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And while we're all very concerned about, uh, about private property rights, and uh, I believe eminent domain should be used only in justified circumstances, obviously to protect private property rights, um, is there any concern here that we're going to increase the burden or cost on local governments who are actually seeking to do something necessary for the benefit of the public? Um, have, have we heard any, have you heard any concerns from local governments or uh, any others um, about increased cost on local budgets? Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, leader, what we're doing is making sure this bill takes care of all the infrastructure. This wouldn't have any anything that you're doing for public use, such as infrastructure. It has no burden on that. This is for separate uses that they're fixing to do something else with. We've taken all that. So when I've spoken to local government, they have not told me that this is going to increase their 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 financial burden of condemning property. No. Jeremy Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I don't see on the list of exemptions education or education facilities. Is there a reason that education needs are not on that? Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If education is included in the term public use for the TCA, it would be fine. And this bill wouldn't have burden on that. Chairman Clemens. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm just, <clears throat> I'm, excuse me, I'm, I'm just concerned that you, we've got specific projects here that are excluded from this bill. But, you know, if, if we need to build a school or an educational institution, that is not included in here. And I don't know what the specific instance was in your county that you're trying to address. And I certainly appreciate that um, and understand your, your desire here and intent. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not increasing the burden if we need to build new schools, if we need to do something along those lines uh, and adding calls to local governments. We're doing plenty of that already. So those are my concerns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Faison. All right. Representative Pearson. Thank you, Speaker. I have a parliamentary inquiry before I have my next comment, so I'll approach the bench.
Mr. Mr. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you um, to everyone for helping to get clarification related to this. So, uh, sponsor, uh, again, uh, uh, property rights are paramount, right? And in Tennessee, like this matters significantly. I've worked with Mr. Clyde Robinson and Ms. Molly Robinson, Mrs. Scotty Fitzgerald, uh, who were facing eminent domain lawsuits before. Uh, so this is an issue that's extremely important to me and the taking of people's land and the possibility of folks' land being taken is something that is just of, of paramount importance uh, for our district and for our community having had to fight eminent domain lawsuits before. While I agree completely um, with all of the four points that you mentioned, people need to prove the public use. They need to have a schedule for the completion of the project. They must have, must have cash and financing, and there needs to be a determination of whether other property is available. All of that that is listed in uh, section one, I am 100% in agreement of. What I am not in agreement with is section C. And this is what my amendment was focused on colleagues, because while all of those things are important, I believe, and I think most of us believe, getting those things checked out anytime eminent domain is being used is important. I do not believe that we should have an exemption. And so what section four says, section C says, is this section does not apply to condemnation actions for projects or uses regarding streets, highways, roads, bridges, transportation, utilities, utility water, public water projects, sewer, and electricity. I don't care if someone was building a park. I think all four of these requirements that are listed above need to be considered before we allow someone to use eminent domain to take our land or to take our constituents' land. And so I, I just want to understand from you, why are we given these exceptions for these other uses instead of requiring everybody who use eminent domain to have uh, to go through the process that's outlined above? Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pearson, I'm encouraged that 80% of the bill you agree with, and I, you would think 80% you could vote with me, but I get it. So the last part, let's just have a brief conversation amongst us about the last part. The truth is, is every one of us, unless you spent the night right here in this building, got here because of eminent domain. The, the road that you come in, I-40 from West Tennessee, it was taken. There is a understanding in America and in Tennessee that when the overall greater good for everybody is achievable, that there's sometimes property has to be condemned for everybody. I'm just doing my best to get some parameters for when you can obviously see that the condemner is trying to benefit themselves. If I can stop the condemner from trying to benefit themselves or their buddies, I feel like I've done something good in the state of Tennessee. But when the condemner the state or local municipality is doing something greater good for everybody. I, I think we probably need to be careful going down that aisle. Representative Pearson. And I understand that. But my thing is, if you are doing good for everybody, why can't they just go through the steps outlined above? 
they would be able, if it's for the good of everybody, which I totally agree, um, having streets, having highways can be used for the public good. But we have to also remember the communities that get displaced in that process, the neighborhoods that get separated and split apart. But if you are able to prove, as you wrote in the legislation, one, you have to prove that it's for public use. Two, you must have a schedule that you're going to complete the use after you take ownership of the property. Three, you must have cash and financing. Four, you must ensure that there are no other properties that are around that you could otherwise take to fulfill the process. Why wouldn't we want, regardless, regardless of what they're building, street, highway, more, more sewer systems, all those things, why wouldn't we want them to come to us as a landowner and say, I meet all four of these requirements? I, I just don't think anyone should be beyond the reach of, of protecting property rights, of enshrining that regardless of the use, hopefully it's a good public use, regardless of, of what it is, they are going to come to those landowners, come to our constituents and say, hey, I meet all four of these requirements. That's why this is in effect. And so, so having an exemption for anybody is, is what I, I, I take issue with uh, because I want to protect everybody's property rights regardless of the exact uses that we're exempting here. And so for that reason, that's why I, I cannot support the legislation, but I appreciate you for answering the questions. Chairman Faison, Representative Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I moved previous question. The question has been called. Is there objection? Objection. We're voting on previous question. All those in favor of previous question, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Vote aye. Mr. Clerk, take the vote. Aye, 74, 20 nays. Previous question prevails. We're voting. All those in favor of House Bill 2119 as amended, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Eyes 88, five nays, one present on vote. House Bill 2119, I received constitutional majority. Everybody clear, pass without objection. Most weeks here is table. Five next bill, Mr. Clark. Senate Joint Resolution 968, Burroughs and McCallman and others, a resolution to recognize Tennessee for student success upon its 10th anniversary. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move the concurrent SJR number 968. Leader Lambert moves to concurrent Senate Joint Resolution 968, probably second, Mr. Clark, caught First Amendment. Mr. Speaker, no amendments filed. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a resolution to honor Tennesseans for student success on 10 years of serving public school students. With that, I renew my motion. Leader Lambert renews the motion. Any discussion on the bill? Representative Johnson of Knox. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I find it ironic that we're honoring these folks today, the day after the um, House and Senate voted to pass vouchers. And um, this is an organization that has spent millions over the last few years to take out your friends and your colleagues uh, because they supported public schools. And I know that some of you in this building on both sides of the aisle in this room have received mail against you from this organization. So are we really going to honor an organization that has done nothing for kids but has only worked against people up here who care deeply about public education? Leader Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To my friend from Knox County, I believe in free speech. I believe in the right to assemble. I believe in advocacy. I believe that we should hear from folks who both agree or disagree with, and I believe in supporting public schools. I know you do as well. This organization has done so for 10 years. They've supported many pieces of legislation and opposed many pieces of legislation, but in a free country, I think it's important to recognize those organizations that put their hard work into action to speak to us and all other Tennesseans. Agree or disagree with them, they've been around for 10 years and it's appropriate to recognize them. Thank you for your comments. All right. Representative Travis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Call previous question. Bridge Westman calls their objection. All right, we're voting. 
All those in favor of Senate Joint Resolution 968, vote aye. When the bell rings, those opposed vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Aye, 66, 23 nays, five present on voted. Senate Joint Resolution 968, having received a constitutional majority, I hereby declare concurring without objection. Most week's here's table. Call the next bill, Mr. Clark. House Bill 1708 by Representative McCalman and others relative to charitable organizations. Representative McCalman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage of House Bill 1708 on the third and final consideration. Re Representative McCalman moves passage following second. Mr. Clark, any amendments been filed? Mr. Speaker, no amendments filed. Representative McCalman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this bill is from the Secretary, Secretary of State's office. Pretty simple bill. What it does is it lowers the charitable filing fees from $50 to $10 as a continuation that we've done in previous years. It's paid for by a carry forward balance. Uh, this will save charities in our state uh, almost $2 million during the next fiscal year. Uh, it raises, secondly, it raises a threshold for an audit on the charity from $500,000 to a million dollars. It's the first time since 2007 that this bill, uh, that threshold has been raised. And lastly, it clarifies that professional solicitors for these charities are not exempt from late fees related to their annual reports. And with that, I renew my motion. Representative McCallum renews his motion. Any discussion? Representative Pearson. As a clarification, sponsor, so we'll be losing, it looks like $1.7 million, um, and this is similar to previous years. Can you speak to the fact that the, the fiscal note says a one-time reduction will be absorbed by existing funds available for use under the Division of Business and Charitable Organizations? Representative McCalman. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Representative, yes, that is a carry forward balance. It's a surplus that the Secretary of State's office already has budgeted for that. It's simply using those funds. That $1.7 million is money that's already there is being spent as a carry forward balance. Representative Pearson. Thank you. Do you know how long that's actually going to last? Representative McCalman. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Representative Pearson, I do not. I, I would direct you to the Secretary of State for that, sir. Representative Pearson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, lessening fees for organizations that do good work in our state, I think, is really important. I think there's probably some notification as well that says, you know, they've gotten this $1.7 million, um, has not been collected by the state for several years. And if it's not permanent, letting organizations know that ultimately they may have to pay for this, I think, is something uh, to consider as well. Thank you. Representative McCalman. All right. Representative Johnson Knox. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the sponsor for bringing this bill. I really appreciate it. One of the things that it's going to do to my understanding, and I'll ask if that's correct, is the um, child cares that are nonprofit but not run by churches that have been having to pay for these audits, it's going to allow them to not have to pay for those audits. Is that correct? Rep Representative McCalman. Uh, to my understanding, I believe it is. I've, it, what it does is it increases the threshold from half a million to a million, so it wouldn't be triggered unless they're taking in a million dollars. Representative Johnson. It, right, and, and thank you. I think that covers most of them, maybe not all, but I think it does cover most of them, which will create more seats in our nonprofit day daycares that exist all across the state. Something I've been trying to do for three years, but wouldn't recognize it here, but I appreciate you for doing it. Thank you. Representative McCallum. Uh, thank you for your comments, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you. Representative Fritz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just one question for the sponsor. Uh, the raising of the limit on the charitable, is, is that greatly due to the inflationary impact of recent years? Representative McCallum. Thank you, Speaker. Yes. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Any objection to the question? Seeing none. We're voting. All those in favor of House Bill 1708, vote aye. When the bell rings, those opposed, vote no. As every member voted, Z member which changed their vote. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Ayes 91, no nays. House Bill 1708, having received a constitutional majority, everybody clear, pass without objection, the most reached serious table. Call up next bill, Mr. Clerk.
House Joint Resolution 811 by Representative Sparks and others, a resolution relative to the benefits of chess and education and correctional systems. Representative Sparks, you're recognized. Right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move adoption of H.A.R. 811. Representative Sparks moves adoption of Public Sector. Mr. Clerk, any amendments been filed? Mr. Speaker, no amendments filed. Representative Sparks, you're recognized. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, people may wonder, what's the big deal about the game of chess? What's the big deal about critical thinking skills in the next generation? I want to read a letter that I, many of y'all have heard me share this in committee. We had put together an opioid uh, town hall at Parkway Baptist Church a few years ago and was well attended. Both school superintendents were there. Some judges were there. Both our mayors were there. Um, but I asked the late Dr. Linda Gilbert, what is the silver bullet to reach these young people? This is a letter. Y'all listen to this carefully because she passed away about a week or two after she sent me this. Here's what she says. She says, Mike, good evening. I apologize for the delayed in being delayed in responding. She says, thank you for reaching out. She says, more funding for counselors would certainly help with the area of the social and emotional issues we're seeing. They're vital and many school districts can't fund them. She said, it'd also be helpful for him and other legislators to talk with school superintendents about the issues we're seeing in very young children. This is what's alarming that we should all pay attention to. Here's what she says, members. Remember, this was a 50-year educator with a doctorate degree. She says the behaviors of the six and nine-year-olds are like something we've never seen before. She says they're disorderly, disruptive, and aggressive. Here's what she said again. They are disorderly, disruptive, and aggressive. While bringing all our resources into play, there's no place for these children to go be assessed and treated. She said, I feel good about the Department of Education, what they're trying to accomplish in the area of the whole child, not the part of the child, but the whole child. She says, I'm hopeful that the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse will work alongside them to address the upper tier children. There seems to be no answers. Um, I want to read some facts about the game of chess. It's really pretty intriguing, folks. Chess is 1,500 years old. The longest game, theoretically, is 5,949 moves. The number of possible unique game sets is greater than the number of electrons in the universe. The word checkmate, checkmate, comes from the Persian phrase, Shah Mat, which means the king is dead. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I can get the clerk to read the resolution. Mr. Clerk, please read the resolution. A resolution relative to the benefits of chess and education and correctional systems, whereas the game of chess is ancient and universally recognized game that has been played for centuries, proving its enduring appeal and value, and whereas chess is renowned for its capacity to develop critical thinking skills, strategic planning, and problem-solving abilities among individuals, and whereas educational benefits of chess are well-documented, contributing significantly to the cognitive development of students and enhancing their academic performance, and whereas the skills acquired through chess, such as concentration, pattern recognition, and patience, have positive impact on a student's overall learning experience, and whereas chess provides a unique avenue for promoting conflict resolution and fostering a sense of responsibility and fair play among individuals, and whereas it is important that we invest in programs that not only enhance educational outcomes, but also contribute to the development of essential life skills, and whereas the application of chess programs within correctional facilities has demonstrated positive effects on inmates, including increased focus, self-discipline, and a reduction in recidivism rates, and whereas the game of chess being both educational and rehabilitative, aligns with Tennessee's commitment to investing in initiatives that have a meaningful and lasting impact on the lives of its citizens. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives 113th General Assembly of the State of Tennessee, the sitting occurring, that we recognize the benefits of chess in education and correctional systems and encourage the incorporation of chess programs in schools and correctional facilities across the state. Be it further resolved that we commend the efforts of individuals and organizations working to promote chess as a tool for educational enhancement and rehabilitation. Representative Sparks, you're recognized. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I renew my motion. Representative Sparks, not to repeat earlier, would you like for all those who vote in the affirmative to be considered as co-proud sponsors? Yes, sir. Thanks for asking. Right. Yes, sir. Without exception, exclusion is duly noted. Representative Todd. Thank you, Representative Sparks, for bringing this bill. I appreciate your efforts in recognizing tools that we can use to help our youth 
be better educated, better controlled, and have better self-control. I just appreciate you uh, putting forth this coalition of uh, folks to, to stand beside you and uh, support this legislation. Thank you so much for your efforts. Thank you, Representative Dixie. Hey, I'd like to thank you, Representative Sparks, for bringing this because chess is a great game and it teaches our kids how to critically think. And that's a skill that we need to be successful as we move through our life. So thank you again. Representative Leatherwood. I also want to thank you for this bill and I'll go one step farther. There's an app out there, chess.com. And if anybody wants to sign up, uh, I'm ready for the challenge. Uh, just talk to me later. So let's put a little something behind these words here and see some action. The gauntlet's been tossed. Thank you. Chess.com. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I too want to thank you for bringing this legislation. But I do want to ask you, do you know how to play chess? Representative Sparks. Just a little, sir. Representative Shaw. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll accept that. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Towns. The speaker, thank you very much. Sponsor you. He will. So, you know how to play chess. The rumor was that you knew more about chess pie than checkmate. Would you address that, please? Chess pie, checkmate. Representative Sparks. No, sir. It is good, though. <laughs> Representative Towns. Great bill. Thank you, sir. Representative Parkinson at Leader Camper's desk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my knees are getting tired. Move previous question. Previous question we call. Is there objection? Seeing none, we're voting. All those in favor of House Joint Resolution 811, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Camper, uh, Glenn, uh, Faze and uh, Glenn, uh, let the journal reflect Representative Hastings' excuse. Doggett, uh, Doggett, uh, Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. I was 94, no names. House Joint Resolution 811, having received a constitutional majority, everybody declared adopted without objection. The most freaks here is table. Call it mixed bill, Mr. Clark. House Bill 1931, Rev. Gillespie and others, relative to certain local regulations. Rev. Gillespie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage to HB 1931 on third and final consideration. Rev. Gillespie moves passage to the second. Mr. Clark, call it first member. House Amendment 1 by Rev. Gillespie. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Rev. Gillespie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request this amendment be rolled to the Hill. Without objection, roll to the Hill. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 2 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker. I will withdraw this amendment. Without objection, amendment number two withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 3 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you, Speaker. I will withdraw this amendment. Without objection, amendment number three withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 4 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you, Speaker. Um, this amendment, colleagues, will ensure that the Speaker of the Senate and Speaker of the House of Representatives appoint a joint committee to study the possible implications of this legislation on local law enforcement's ability to prevent crime effectively. The joint committee shall conduct a study and report uh, the results to the General Assembly. The consequences of this legislation are well known. We have had Mr. Rodney Wells, Ms. Ravon Wells come here, ask that this bill be rolled so they have time for further conversation. Everybody's a little shocked that this has come up today. Um, and what we know is as it relates to the ordinances passed in the wake of Mr. Tyree Nichols's death, uh, that a lot of the consequences of Pretextual traffic stops do not fall equitably or evenly on the demographics of people for which it happens. And so with this legislation, we need to study it. We need to understand more what the consequences of this are going to be for our constituents 
and for the people who are going to be impacted by it. Being informed legislators uh, is a part of our responsibility. And so this would include it in this uh, legislation if it moves forward, ensure that we actually study its implications and prepare for the effect that it is going to have to our local law enforcement. And so with that, I move uh, for adoption. Very good. Representative Pearson moves adoption of amendment number four. That's a properly seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Leader Lamberth. Move previous question on the amendment. Previous question has been called. Any objection? We're voting on amendment number four. All those in favor of adopting amendment number four, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Barrett's a no. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Ayes 24, 68 nays. Amendment number four fails. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 5 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you, Speaker. I withdraw this amendment. Without objection, amendment number five withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 6 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you, Speaker. Colleagues, Memphis Police Department is currently under a pattern in practice investigation by the Department of Justice. This came in the wake of Mr. Tyree Nichols' death, but it also came in the wake of a lot of people in our constituency of Shelby County paying more attention to what is going on and asking, and even colleagues here, asking that the Department of Justice help us to improve our local law enforcement agency. If during the time that this investigation is happening and its results lead to the need for ordinance to ordinances to be passed in order for the negative pattern and practices um, to cease, then this policy, this legislation would no longer uh, be in effect. And the reason that that matters is because as has been mentioned, this legislation in particular targets efforts being made by people in Memphis and people in Shelby County to make our streets safer for all of our constituents. We want to make sure that the Department of Justice's investigation and the results therein allow for our streets to be safer for everybody, allow for our community to be safer for everybody. And we do not want this legislation to override the good work that has happened by the Wells family. It is not being supported. This legislation is not being supported by Mayor Paul Young or our city council. And so our community does not want this. And so this ensures that if the Department of Justice's pattern and practice investigation investigation calls for some substantial changes to happen to our police department to ensure that it does the work that, that they are supposed to do without targeting, without hurting and harming our community, that this legislation preventing that from happening will no longer be in effect for our community. We have to ensure that there are some checks on the things that are happening in, car, in our communities and allow for local control of that. And so with that, Speaker, I move adoption. Representative Pearson moves adoption of amendment number six properly. Seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Speaker Pro Tem Marsh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call previous question. Previous question been called. Is there objection? There's objection. We're on previous question. All those in favor of previous question on amendment number six, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Aye, 68, 24 nays. Previous question prevails. We're voting. All those in favor of adopting amendment number six, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Ayes 28, 65 nays. Amendment number six fails. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 7 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you, Speaker. I'll remove this amendment. Withdraw this amendment. Without objection, Amendment number 7 withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 8 by Representative Pearson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Pearson, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Speaker. I'll withdraw this amendment. Without objection, Amendment number 8 withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. House Amendment 9 by Chairman Whitson. Mr. Speaker, it was timely filed. Representative Whitson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In discussion with the sponsor, this is considered a friendly amendment. 
move to for adoption and defer to the sponsor for explanation. Representative Whitson moves adoption of amendment number nine, properly seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, any objection to the question? Representative Hardaway? Um, on the amendment, a fuller explanation, please. Order, please. Representative Hardaway. I'd like a fuller explanation on the amendment, please. Yes, sir. Representative Gillespie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What this amendment does, and I'll just read it to you here, that a local government or entity or official shall not adopt or enact a resolution, ordinance, or policy that prohibits or limits the ability of a law enforcement agency to conduct traffic stops based on the observation of or reasonable suspicion that the operator of a passenger in a vehicle has violated a local ordinance or state or federal law. A resolution, ordinance, that, or policy that is adopted in violation of this section is null and void. Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Speaker. If that policy is enacted in order to reallocate resources of the department to better deliver public safety to the community, is that allowed under this uh, amended, this amendment? Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The entire purpose of this amendment is to allow law enforcement to keep our streets safe. Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Speaker. That, that doesn't address my question. My question is in reference to the ability of the law enforcement agency to decide how to allocate resources. If they find that their resources are better directed towards more violent crime or towards investigations, et cetera, would this amendment prohibit that or allow that? Representative Gillespie. Thank you so much. Uh, this amendment would allow law enforcement as long as they're following state or local, state or federal law to do their job. Representative Hardaway. I didn't understand the last part. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, renew my motion. All right. Chairman Holsey, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To, to answer my colleague's question over here, there, there's got to be another way to find the answer because when a police officer sworn in, he raises his hand and swears that he will enforce all the laws of the state of Tennessee and city ordinances as well. If a city or county government comes up with a resolution or passes an ordinance, say then they can't do that, you have conflicting oaths and you put an officer in a terrible position. It's not right. Representative Gillespie, you're recognized. Thank you so much, Speaker. And Chairman, you are absolutely correct. And that is one of the issues that we're dealing right now with that conflict. Representative Towns. Mr. Speaker, is it on the bill? No, we're on an amendment. On the bill. On the All right, bill. we'll add you to the list. Any further conversation, discussion on the amendment? Number nine, see none, any objection to the question? See none. All those in favor of adopting amendment number nine, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. As every member voted, does any member which change their vote? <laughs> Mr. Clark, please take the vote. Aye, 71, 19 days, one present, I voted. Amendment number nine is adopted. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, that brings the body back to the heel of the amendments. House Amendment 1 by Representative Gillespie. Representative Gillespie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move passage of House Bill 1931. Members, we can all agree that the law enforcement... Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I re renew my motion.
Representative Gillespie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to withdraw. Without objection, amendment number one withdrawn. Next amendment, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, no further amendments. Representative Gillespie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I renew my motion. Representative Gillespie renews his motion. Any discussion? Representative Hardaway, you're recognized. But the chief could say there's burglaries and robberies and murders going on over here. All right. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I was getting the expert advice from the noted law enforcement uh, officer in the General Assembly, uh, Chairman Bud Hustler. Um, uh, to the sponsor, if there is a, an efficiency quotient that can be addressed by the chief of police reallocating resources and redirecting the, through policy, redirecting the actual uh, actions of the personnel, will this bill as amended allow that? Still allow that? It's, it's currently policy. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So my understanding of your question is, or the answer to your question is, as long as those policies do not conflict with state or federal law, then yes, they can do that. Representative Hardaway. Thank you uh, for that straight answer. The other question that I have is what the data, whether it's statistical uh, data or whether it's anecdotal, uh, what is it that brought you to this point? I'm sure that you looked at the difference in the numbers of uh, the crime statistics since this policy has been in place locally and before it was put in place locally. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I mean, it makes me sad to say this, but the data is Memphis has more crime than anywhere else in the state of Tennessee. Last year, we reached record highs. I have constituents, I have uh, neighbors, and I have members of the community that are begging, begging, begging for safer streets, and this will do exactly that. Representative Hardaway. Thank you, Speaker. So in other words, there is no data that drives this legislation. It's more anecdotal. We haven't had studies to indicate whether or not the cessation of the pretextual uh, stops has added to or taken away from the ability of law enforcement to allocate resources and direct personnel towards more serious crimes. That question, Mr. Speaker, is for the sponsor or for Chairman Faison, since Gillespie. he's in the way of. Representative Gillespie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Again, I just told you the data. Memphis is the least safe it's been in a very, very, very long time since I believe the records have been kept. That is the data that I'm using. Representative Hardaway. Thank you. The data that you're using, I'm, I'm still wondering what it is. You didn't give me any numbers. And that broad general scope of crime and how it's risen, whether it's property or uh, personal uh, assaults or carjackings or, or whatever, Unless we allow, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, the bottom of this. Unless we allow, I'm sure you're familiar that there's a United States Department of Justice pattern of practice investigation on unlawful policing methods that have persisted in the Memphis Police Department for years. It's institutional. And there had to be evidence offered to the DOJ before they would begin the pattern of practice investigation. I know this because I was intimately involved. 
So I would suggest that what we're doing today just may not only interfere with the investigation and cause it to have to be extended, but it will probably make us look bad for putting in place something that will take away from the ability for MPD and for local law enforcement and local administrations to improve their lot. So I'm voting against your bill. Thank you. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I renew my motion. Representative Harris. Thank you, Speaker, and to the sponsor. When the ordinances went into place that triggered this legislation, do you know what happened right after? Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are you referring to the ordinances that the, the city council passed last year in regarding to traffic stops? Representative Harris. Yes, sponsor. Representative Gillespie. Uh, I know that they passed ordinances that violate state law and also, in my opinion, violate common sense. Representative Harris. The six months following, if, since we were mentioning data just a moment ago, the six months following the ordinance being put in place, the crime in Memphis went down. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, well, th this ordinance was not actually enforced until I believe January 2nd or 3rd of this year when Mayor Young announced it. So the, pre the six months after it was passed, it was not actually being enforced due to Mayor Strickland vetoing the bill. Representative Harris. On last week when the Wells family came, you got an opportunity to meet with them. And in that conversation, you had stated that you would work with them to um, discuss this bill. Did, did you not? Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I've had multiple conversations with them and they will remain private. Representative Harris. Great. And so based off of what the Wells family stated, did you speak with them on yesterday? Representative Gillespie. No, sir. Representative Harris. Did you speak with them the day before that? Representative Gillespie. Uh, that would be Tuesday, yes. Representative Harris. And in that conversation, did you inform them not to come up to um, the Capitol because this bill would not be ran until next week? Representative Gillespie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm having a hard time understanding what this has to do with this bill. Right. Representative Harris? What it has to do with the bill is that you had a conversation with your people that are in your community and you had informed them that you would have a working relationship with them to be able to work through this legislation. And one of the issues that I have is that the quality of integrity is in question and being honest with what you were saying you were going to do. One of the Rep things- Representative Harris, we gotta stick to the bill. So I would ask you to, to get back up on the bill. Representative Harris. Representative, did you work with the individuals that were involved in this to make sure that this legislation was in good place. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, all I'm talking about here is the ordinances that were passed last year by the Memphis City Council and put in place this year. Representative Harris. The family, the Wales family worked on that ordinance that passed. Did you get an opportunity to work with them to make sure that this was in good, good place? Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I still don't understand what this has to do with the bill. The bill at hand has to do with a local ordinance, and it's my understanding that the people you're referring to are not members of the local body. They're not members of the General Assembly. So I'm, I'm trying to stay with the bill here. Representative Harris. You're, you're absolutely right, but they are absolutely part of your community. They are members of your community that make up the city council, the state body, and so I'm asking, did you get an opportunity to work with them? Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I already stated before, the conversations that I've had with the family will remain private. Representative Harris. Thank you, sponsor. We are, our city is uh, 
hurting in many different ways. There are a lot of issues that we have. Um, crime is, is large, and there's many ways that we can work through all of that. But we can't make decisions based on just one individual person. Um, as a community, individuals were involved in the legislation that uh, happened on a local level, and I would hope that you would have worked with us as a whole, as all of us, as there's no one supporting from Memphis uh, on the local level of this piece of legislation. There's not even one of us signed on to that. And so the conversation should have been as a whole if we're going to make any decisions um, for our local body. But I, I, to the Wells family, um, I would hope that you would work with them in the future. Thank you. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've been working on this legislation since last fall. I've had multiple conversations with the community, the press, and everyone in this room. So. All right, Representative Pearson. Thank you, Speaker. I am pretty upset that this wasn't even discussed to be sent back to committee. I didn't even know House floor amendments were something folks here were supportive of. I'm a little shocked that we're actually debating on whether or not to vote for this instead of sending this back to committee because time after time I've heard after amendments get added, it goes back to the committee before it gets heard on this floor. Um, and so uh, if someone can explain how this is even happening today. The second problem that I have is uh, we have talked a lot about parental grief in this chamber as it relates to gun violence and the mothers at Covenant and mothers over murder and people uh, who have come here advocating for different types of legislation, whether it be autopsies or red flag laws. But when it is coming to the grief of this beloved black family, of Mr. Rodney Wells and Mrs. Rovon Wells, Mrs. Rovon Wells' son was killed by Memphis Police Department in January of last year. The community spoke up the community organized and galvanized and rallied. This same community that you were saying you spoke to to write this legislation. Our community rose up and spoke up. They went to their local government, their locally elected officials, and said, here are some things that would have helped Tyree Nichols to be alive today. And instead of this body saying, this is what we want from our constituents, for them to be engaged in the democratic process, for them to advocate for the things that they believe are going to make them safer, that they believe are going to improve the quality of life. But instead of doing that up here, you as a person who lives in Shelby County seek to undo the will of the people of Memphis and Shelby County. You, you saw the Wells family, spoke with them briefly, told them this bill wouldn't come up until probably next Thursday. So they said, well, we won't come up and try and lobby our Republican legislators, try and lobby our people in Shelby County to change this in order for it to be in a better posture. But instead, you are here before us today on a bill that should be going back to committee, having lied to them. You did. Representative Pearson, Representative Pearson. Representative Todd, Representative Todd, what's, what's the objection? The representative has impugned a member by saying he's lying. He is out of order. M Mr. Clerk. Well, the, the situation is, is, um, Mr. Clark, you want to explain it so that they could be a little bit more clear? Mr. Speaker, under Rule 19, the, the, a mem the speaker or any member may call a member to order. The member may sit down or if the member wishes to proceed and there's an appeal, then the body will vote. Chairman Clemens? All right.
Chairman Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Clerk, I appeal um, the, dis the call to order pursuant to the rules. That's the proper motion. Probably second, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, the, the member has been called to order pursuant to Rule 19. There is an appeal. Now the body will decide whether the member shall continue or not. A I vote, yes vote is for the member to continue with their allotted time. A no vote does not allow to continue on their allotted time. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Mr. Clerk, take the vote. Ayes 25, 66 nays. Motion prevails. To discontinue speaking and move on to the next one on the list. We are next. Re Chairman Farmer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Gillespie, I want to I thank second. you for bringing Hang this Hang piece second. of legislation. Hey, Chairman Farmer, one second. Mr. Clark. Mr. Speaker, the parliamentary inquiry was, could the member that was called to order return to the list for this bill? And the answer is yes. On the list. Chairman Farmer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move previous question. Oh. Well, yeah, Chairman Farmer, you started speaking, so you, you got to continue with your time or, or... Okay. all right, Chairman Farmer. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Gillespie. You and I serve on the Criminal Justice Committee together. We've served on several committees over the past couple of years that, that you've been here. I personally witnessed your passion and your willingness to serve your community and serve your constituents. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions about the crime in your community. Um, and, and, and fortunately... That's a warning to the balcony. Continue, Chairman Farmer. And, and fortunately... Um, I serve portions of Sevier and Jefferson counties. And at any point in time, Sevier County will have a quarter million people coming into town to, to visit. So we're almost like a, we, we, come, we, we grow from a small town to a very large town. And because our law enforcement there has the ability to enforce the law and arrest people when they've done things that are wrong, and our judicial commissioners set bail for those who commit crimes that are worthy of, of bail, say if someone's shot, someone's vehicle's broken into, something's stolen, they're held accountable for their actions. And that's important. And I see, I see accountability in this piece of legislation. That's Representative, all please refrain from shouting. That's your warning. Chairman Farmer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I see accountability in this legislation. If people think that they can go and they can break into cars, they can shoot people, they can hurt people, they can rape, then, and, and they're not held accountable, and, they, and they're, they're arrested and just let go with, with no bail whatsoever, it's gonna, it's gonna happen again. Are you, so my point is- Representative Pearson, what's your call to order? I need the microphone. Thank you. The bill has to do with traffic stops and local law enforcement, has nothing to do with rape, has nothing to do with the things that the representative is currently talking about. He is off the bill and out of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker. I'll take that in consideration. Chairman Farmer, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll get to the point. Thank you for this piece of legislation. Thank you for supporting law enforcement to allow them to do what the state law says they need to do. There's a thing called the Supremacy Clause. We can't go against federal law. So therefore, the locals need to adhere and enforce the laws that we pass. That's why we're here. Chairman Clemens, you're recognized.
Representative Russell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And to the sponsor, I also want to thank you for bringing this legislation before us today. Law enforcement officers receive the very best training in the state of Tennessee because of the standards and training mandated by the Tennessee Peace Officers Commission. A law enforcement officer must rely on that training when called upon, allowing local bureaucrats to make unnecessary guardrails limiting an officer's authority will ultimately undermine their training and will result in failure to maintain law and order. Members, when someone needs help, they don't pick up a phone and call a local elected official. They call the men and women that will respond and take care of business by being able to enforce all the laws. The primary responsibility of those men and women in law enforcement is to safeguard lives and property. If there's a local government hindering those officers from doing their job, our primary responsibility is to safeguard our law enforcement officers by giving them, them the uh, ability to perform their duties. This is a no-brainer. A vote for this bill is a vote to back the blue, and a vote against this bill is a vote to limit law enforcement's authority, which will result and higher crime and lawlessness. Sponsor, I support you and back in the blue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Then Gillespie, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chairman Russell, for those comments. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I applaud my colleague that just spoke about backing in the blue but we didn't back the blue when it came to permitless carry. Let's not forget that. This is about local control. And my colleague in the will is the chairman of the Shelby delegation. He is the leader of the Shelby County delegates. The members that are elected from Memphis and Shelby County to come up here and carry the message of Memphians and Shelby Countyans. I've been here for 14 years. I've never seen a chairman of the Shelby delegation run legislation blatantly contrary to our local legislative bodies. Our local legislative bodies actually come to us to carry their message. And I can say this with authority and experience because I too was the chairman of the Shelby delegation. My question to the sponsor, and, and I pray that Mr. Sponsor, you don't run the clock on me because I have some serious legitimate questions. My question to the sponsor is, did you discuss your bill with the members of the Shelby delegation at the delegation meeting to get our input regarding your bill? Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe you're referring to the delegation meeting that we held at the University of Memphis last fall. And yes, crime was the number one topic. And I believe that the speakers that were there reiterated that point. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, I'm not talking about that meeting. I'm talking about all of the meetings we've had this year leading up to or while this legislation has been drafted. Have you discussed that your legislation with the body of the Shelby delegation, your legislation specifically with the body of the Shelby delegation to get, garner our input or support or concerns about your legislation? Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have talked to many people about this legislation, both at home, on the Memphis City Council, on the Shelby County Commission, and in this room. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman of the Shelby delegation, did you consult or speak to all of the members on the City Council about your proposed legislation? 
Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, not all of them, but I've talked to many of them that were on the body last year and the people that were elected this year, including my current representative on the city council, who is in full support of this legislation, and the person on the prior uh, prior uh, term. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman of the Shelby delegation, who is your current council member because you said you spoke to him and who is the prior that you spoke to and that and that supports your bill? This, this is on the bill, Mr. Speaker. Well, technically, it's there's latitude being given because the bill doesn't deal with conversations who help to get the language. Rep Representative Gillespie. Thank you. I'll, I'll answer that question. Uh, Philip Spinoza is my current city council member and Worth Morgan was the prior. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the latitude, because here's my point that I was trying to make about this. The ordinance that was passed by Memphis City Council, those that you said lack common sense, was passed by Councilwoman Michael and Easter Thomas, who was the sponsor, Councilwoman Rhonda Logan, Councilman Chase Carlisle, Councilman J.B. Smiley, Councilman Ford Canale, Councilman Edmund Ford Sr., Councilwoman Cheyenne Johnson, Councilwoman Patrice Robinson, Councilman Martavius Jones, Councilwoman Jamita Swearingen, Councilman Jeff Warren, Councilman Frank Covet, and guess who else? Your Councilman, Councilman Worth Morgan, who you said supports your legislation, but he voted with the unanimous group of the uh, Memphis City Council to pass the resolution. So I, I, I'm trying to find where that, how that gels. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I, this is about local control. Sh Mr. Delegation Chair, I find it appalling that you would run this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Speaker. This is not a local act. This applies statewide, and it is simply saying that there are certain state laws that have been on the books for a very long time, and all we're saying is that local law enforcement has to enforce state law. There's nothing more to this legislation than, than just that. Representative McCalman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If you would roll me one space. No objection. Representative Towns, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, the concern I have is that all of us sat here a couple of days ago and talked to this family. I don't know what's exactly going on, but these people called me and talked with me as well. They are under the impression that we're going to run this this coming Wednesday. I mean, this coming Thursday, next Thursday. Now, the conversations you said with them were private, but they shared with me that maybe you were to go to one of the Carolinas, come back, y'all were going to meet Monday, and y'all were going to talk about it. Whether that made any changes or not, they're still hurting, and they wanted to talk with you, see if they can get into movement on changing or modifying the legislation. Obviously, a, a family that's been through that kind of trauma, all of us are wanting to do something about crime. We all do. Everybody wants to do something about crime. We're trying. We don't know exactly what to do, but we're trying. But they should have been shown deference because of the situation, the gravitas of the situation, the personal loss that they've had. And they were looking for you to do what they thought the conversation was is scheduled for next Thursday. I thought it was next Thursday, too. Now, this is directly coming from them. And I would like to try to satisfy that. You're in control. You're in the catbird seat. I wish we could roll the bill until Thursday, and give them an opportunity to come back so we can save face with our constituents. They are your constituents as well, you know, but the deal of it is, I'm asking if you'd be amenable to rolling the bill to Thursday so they can come back and talk with you Monday, like they said. The outcome is still going to be the same, but for their hurting heart, for their bleeding heart, the heartache they have, I wish we could roll it. So I'm posing that to you, see if we could do that. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My heart goes out to that family. I have had multiple conversations with that family. 
However, I do not set the calendar here. This bill was rolled to this week. I had a conversation with them and explained the amendment process and explained what I was trying to do. And with that, I, uh, I renew my motion. Represent Towns. As you know, uh, let's see if you can go back and think about when you first became a member. It's difficult to understand the complexities of what we do. You can stand there, we can now and sound like a champ. But think about a layperson coming here and trying to understand the complexity of what we're trying to do. You may have talked to them and they may not understood it totally because it's not that easy sometimes for lay people to understand. So with that in mind, I will still pose a reconsideration of just rolling the bill forward next week to give them an opportunity. Y'all have a great conversation about what is happening. At that point, everybody feels better about the fact that this family has had an opportunity to have this say with you directly because you have the bill. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just with the complexity of the calendar and how many times this bill has already been rolled, I'm uncomfortable in doing that. Representative Towns. Well, let me do this then. I'd love to have you lead it, but members, I'm just gonna simply make a motion that we do roll it until next Thursday. That's proper motion, proper seconded. Any objection? objection? There's objection. We're on the board. All those in favor of rolling House Bill 1931 to next week? Is that right? Vote Thursdays, rolling it to Thursdays. Vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Mr. Clerk, take the vote. Ayes 25, 65 nays. Motion fails. Representative Towns, you're recognized. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you for that. We're gonna take another bite at the apple. I know we had some amendments to add on to the bill. So I'm gonna make a motion that we roll it back to uh, local government as well. That would be a re-refer. Uh, thank you, re-refer. I need Banner White. <laughs> All right. Motion was to re-refer re it back to local, state, which committee? It's local. Local. Re-refer it to local committee. Probably second. There is objection. We are voting. All those in favor of re-referring House Bill 1931 to local committee, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Mr. Clerk, take the vote. Ayes 25, 66 noes. Motion fails. Representative Towns. Mr. Chairman, members, thank you again. Mr. Speaker, members, I've been here a long time. And one of the things that I've learned that's a valuable lesson for anything that you do, especially in this business, is that you need to keep your word with people in our communities, and anything that we do, people gauge us under a different guise. And even if there's a misunderstanding, we typically don't get the benefit of the doubt. Okay, lawyers, elected officials, and sometimes other professions don't get the benefit of the doubt. So our word is very important and very critical to, to us that people respect what we're doing and trying to do for them. I hope we can get this confusion cleared up because right now uh, they have a bewildered, hurtful taste in their mouths based upon just the legislation being heard today. Not that it was gonna change the outcome, but that's for uh, future references. I'd love to see how we can control and uh, make this better for that family. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Representative Gillespie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I renew my motion. Representative McCalman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, with the previous question. Previous question been called, there's objection. We're on the board voting. All those in favor of previous question, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. Aye, 68, 24 nays. Previous question prevails. Let the record reflect Representative 
Vital as excuse. We're voting on House Bill 1931 as amended. All those in favor, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. As every member voted, does any member wish to change their vote? Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. I 68, 24 nays. House Bill 1931, having received a constitutional majority, I hereby declare passed by objection to most considers table. Call the next bill, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Speaker, that completes the regular calendar. Next order, Mr. Clerk. Unfinished business. Unfinished business. Representative Martin of Hamilton, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to withdraw House Bill 2027 from the committee and the House. You've heard the motion. Any objections? Without objections, so ordered. Chairman Clemens, you're recognized. Mr. Clark. Mr. Speaker, the parliamentary inquiry was, what is the vote requirement for the motion of previous question in committee? The answer is two thirds of the members present. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Mr. Speaker, please roll me a space. Representative Speaker, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to refer House Joint Resolution 998 to the Calendar and Rules Committee. Without objection, so ordered. Yes, A little late. The gavel hit before you objected. <laughs> Chairman Haraway. Speaker, um, if a member misses the opportunity... Representative Hardaway, you got to come to the desk. You don't do it from your desk. You got to come to the well.
Ms. Clark. Ms. Speaker, the parliamentary inquiry was, can the motion to refer to committee be reconsidered? The answer is no. Clear Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move that the rules be suspended for immediate consideration of SJR number 1110. Ms. Clerk, please read the caption. Senate Joint Resolution 1110, Melita Lambert, the resolution to call a joint convention of the Senate and House of Representatives for the purpose of voting on the confirmation of Mary L. Wagner to the Supreme Court of Tennessee pursuant to Article 11, Section 3 of the Constitution of Tennessee and Tennessee Code Annotated, Title 17, Chapter 4. You've heard the caption. Any objections? Without objections, the rules are suspended. Clear Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Move to concur in SJR number 1110. Lear Lambert moves to concur in Senate Joint Resolution 1110, probably seconded. Any discussion? On Senate Joint Resolution 1110? No. You need, I, I can't hear you. All right, Lear Lambert moves to concur in Senate Joint Resolution 1110, probably seconded. Any objection to the question? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye, aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. I declare it concurred in with the objection. Most weeks here is stable. Lear Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that H, uh, House Bill 2647 be heard in the Children and Family Subcommittee next week. Uh, my understanding there is no objection from the minority party on this one. You've heard the motion. Any objections? Without objection? So ordered. Leader Lambert, do you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I do not anticipate objections after concurring with uh, my, my, my concurrent leader on House Bill 2670. I make a motion to be heard. That bill be heard in Criminal Justice Subcommittee next week. Thank you. You've heard the motion. Any objections? Without objection. So ordered. Lear Lambert, you're recognized. Nope. All right. Mr. Clark. Mr. Speaker, we have a message from the Senate. Mr. Speaker, I'm directed to return to the House. House Bill 619, substitute for the Senate bill on the same subject committed and passed by the Senate. Thursday's message calendar. Unfinished business. Representative Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am appalled by some some violence that occurred on the House floor today. Representative and I Jones, you're out of order. It's unfinished business. I'm sorry, you're out of order. Representative Jones. I would like to make a motion to censure Representative Scott Sapicki for almost fighting a member on this House floor, Chairman John Ray Clements, engaging in disorderly conduct. He should be censured. He had to be held back by members under Tennessee law. Any provocative conduct is considered assault in Tennessee. He should be censured for this violent behavior. The, the media have pictures and video of him almost fighting a member on this House floor. The media box saw what happened. The photographers saw what happened. Representative Sapicki should be censured for disorderly conduct. And, and, and there, should be, there should be a resolution of expulsion because that's what we do for disorderly conduct. All right, but I'm making Jones, a motion. We got you. We got you. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would object to that censure and ask for a vote on this matter. I was present for the verbal interaction between two members in a spirited debate. I know that we all respect each other deeply on this floor, and when two members get into a spirited verbal interaction with each other, it is not always an opportunity to welt in the sunlight like a snowflake. All right, members, there was a proper motion, probably seconded. There's objection. We're voting on the board. All those in favor of censoring Representative Sapicki, vote aye when the bell rings. Those opposed, vote no. <laughs> Mr. Clerk, take the vote. Aye, 1367 nays. Motion fails. Next order, Mr. Clerk. 
Announcements. Announcements. Representative Powers, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The House Banking and Consumer Affairs Subcommittee will begin hearing its final calendar on Tuesday, March 19th. The deadlines to place bills on notice for the final calendar will be 3.30 p.m. on Wednesday, March 13th. Wednesday, March 13th can be an unlucky day. It'll be at 3.30 p.m. is a deadline. Representative Johnson and Knox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was just wondering, I did object um, Rule 19 for um, the leader disparaging a member. Is that not going to be addressed or? You weren't recognized and we didn't hear it, so we're under announcements. You have an announcement. We'll stay. Nope, does not. All right. Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to announce that uh, in February, Metro Public Schools was highlighted for their national recovery efforts post-pandemic. Great job, Metro National Public Schools. Representative Howe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, if you are a member of the Fiscal Review Committee, please go immediately to House Hearing Room 1. We'll start the committee as soon as we adjourn. Representative Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to announce that we need to bring the House in order and stop the white-on-white -white violence that continues to happen in this building. That wasn't an announcement, but nice try. Representative Capley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to let all the members know that Frank Hughes School in Clifton, Tennessee, their basketball team is headed to state. Members, they have less than 100 students in this school, so y'all please uh, wish them well. Thank you. Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I have one of my good friends and Cock County School Superintendent and his lovely wife in the balcony. Would y'all make them feel welcome? <laughs> Representative Hazelwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Appropriation amendments can be filed in my office starting on Monday. Uh, well, actually today until Monday, March 18th by 5 o'clock. My office is going to provide each member with all the documents and the instructions for filing those amendments. That material is being distributed to you as I speak, and it will be emailed as well. You'll get a paper copy and an email. If you have any questions about the instructions or the filling out of the request, then I would refer you to our budget director, Jessica Himes. And also, Mr. Speaker, remind the members of the Finance Committee, we will resume budget hearings Monday morning at 9. Thank you. Representative Todd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to announce two things. One, the always anticipated Ag Day is coming up on the 19th of this month. So put that on your calendar. There'll be a lot of festivities around that. And that date, March 19th, is also the last calendar for the Agriculture and Natural Resources Subcommittee. Thank you, sir. Representative Mitchell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also like to recognize Metro Nashville Public Schools. They were the only school district in the nation to rank in the top five in two different categories in this Harvard study that recognized their achievements bouncing back better than any other school district in the country from the pandemic. Thank you. Representative Littleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the House Children and Family Affairs Subcommittee will begin here in its final calendar on Tuesday, March 19th. Bills for this final calendar will need to be put on notice by 3.30 on Wednesday, March 13th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Harris. Thank you, thank you Speaker. Uh, for the Shelby County delegation, we're going to have an emergency meeting in 5C immediately after session. Thank you. Representative Parks. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaking of great public schools, the Douglas Red Devils from Douglas, Tennessee, with a record of 33 and 0, 
will go to the state championship to kick the beep out of Austin East from Knoxville on this Thursday coming up. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaking of great public schools. Leader Camper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, members, earlier you heard that the Jack and Jill of America students were here, but who is also here with that group is uh, Dr. Jamila Smith-Young, who is the first lady for the city of Memphis, and her daughter, Zoe, who's a seventh grader from Hutchison School in Memphis, and former Representative D. Dawkins Hagler from the great state of Georgia. Georgia, will you make them feel welcome? Representative Capway. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, my apologies. Also, the Wayne County Lady Cats move on to the single A semifinals after defeating South Fulton 61 to 40. We wish them good luck as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Rudd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, the final calendar of the House Elections and Campaign Finance Subcommittee will be Wednesday, March 27th. The deadline to place bills on notice for the final calendar will be Wednesday, March 20th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any further announcements? Next order, Mr. Clark. Oh, Mr. Clark, make your announcement. Mr. Speaker, for the benefit of the members, last night the K-12 subcommittee calendar was issued with a bill House Bill 77, 7077 by Representative Hardaway. That is an extraordinary session bill that cannot be considered during regular session. It was calendared in error, so that bill will not be taken up this week in K-12. All right, next order, Mr. Clark. Roll call. Roll call. Mr. Clerk, take the roll. Mr. Speaker, 90 members present. Next order, Mr. Clerk. That completes the regular order, Mr. Speaker. Leader Lambert, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the House stand in recess until 4 p.m. on Monday, March the 11th, 2024. Without objection, the House stands in recess until 4 p.m. on Monday, March 11th, 2024.